If you look for it, every day has cause for celebration. Celebrate a friend for their promotion baby wedding life thing. Celebrate yourself for keeping the couch warm. It's no easy feat, especially if it's a big couch. Or maybe you just want to celebrate living in 2023 where you can get beer, wine, and spirits delivered from Drizzly in under 60 minutes without leaving said couch. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com and get your favorite drinks delivered today. I walk a straight line, shackled and chained. everyone and welcome to bloody angola a podcast 142 years in the making the complete story of america's bloodiest prison and i'm jim chapman and i'm woody overton and we're going to talk about camp j today woody yeah y'all this is the camp j is all was always controversial and certainly we can't cover all of camp j in one episode but we're not gonna make a series out of this we're just gonna bring you some as we go along, everything from uh, Jim's f- phenomenal research on stuff uh, and, and some of the stuff we're going to play today, to in the future having uh, former inmates that were in, in Camp J and all that. But let me tell you real quick about Camp J. If you go back on the history part, you remember when they closed the Red Hat cell block, they had to come up with a new area to house the worst of the worst. And that was Camp J. And if you're sitting there and you're wondering, what is the Red Hat cell block? Well, we covered that in, I believe it was season two's opener of Bloody Angola. So one thing I'll make sure I do is link that in the description, because some of you may just, this may be your first episode right. with Bloody Angola. So with the, the Red Hat cell block, y'all, was notorious, and, and they ended up shutting it down. I mean, how bad does a fucking place have to be if you're going to shut it down and when when it's housing people that nobody cares about? Um, the But to get locked up in these places, like the Red Hat before they shut it down, the, the, the new and improved Camp J when they opened it up, you have to be a real, real problem. Now, it doesn't matter what your crime is that you commit on the street – when you get to Angola, you get classified, and most convicts do their time in dormitories. But you get locked down on at Camp J was a extended lockdown CCR yeah, closed cell restricted yeah, uh, cell block. But to get locked up there, you, you didn't just get in a fist fight with another inmate. That's that's a regular working cell block or 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 admin seg thing. You had to either attack a guard with weapons, not just a fist fight. Uh, you know, weapons could be feces or urine, also, or get caught smuggling drugs in, or escape, or try to escape. Rape, rape, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get caught raping somebody. I mean, it, it, you, it was such an. You had to do something so bad that they wanted to lock you away from the rest of the prison population. Think about it as uh, a prison inside a prison. So one of the questions you may have had was, well, you're already in prison. What else can they do to you? Well, they have to have a place they can send you that is even worse 
than the situation you're already in. You're right. already in jail. Right. You're already being told when to, you know, when to shit, when to, right. when to eat, all those sorts of things. So what can they do to you uh, outside of that in CCR units or lockdowns or whatever you want to call it? Uh, Camp J was the place that you went to when you broke the rules in prison. The, the worst rules. Yes. They, like killed somebody or whatever. Shame. Now, when you get – Jugged them up. When you get – right? <laughs> killed them good. Oh, <laughs> killed them good. <laughs> um, when you get sent to Camp J, you have to do 90 days before you come up for a review to be released back in the general population. Now, that's 90 days without a low court or a high court write-up, okay? And that means no rule infractions. So if you're back there on your first day, and most of them do, and, and you fuck up, you do something wrong, guess what happens? You know you got to finish your other 89 days, and you're going to automatically get rejected. So these guys aren't you know, model citizen of a convicts by any means, and they get the other 89 days to fuck up, and you can't do them anymore. Shit. The, at, when your review comes up again, you're automatically getting denied, and then you get a clean slate for the next 90 days. But they got convicts in Camp J that are housed there forever. Forever. I mean, like so many years. And I guess we should tell them a little bit about it. Um, what one thing I want to go into before we do that, just to paint paint the picture here. Right, I was going to paint the pictures it, of the cells and everything else. It, uh, think of it like this, y'all, and and you know, you're if you were like me and you were raised and your your parents would do this to you, um, you maybe you'd say a cuss word. You see how that helped? I still say yeah, cuss right. words every right. now and then. But maybe get the, you get the soap. Yeah, get the soap. You, that's one version. But, you know, a lot of a lot of parents would say, you know, go in the corner, put your nose in the corner, and stand there until I tell you to come Shit, out. My nose just beat my ass. <laughs> <laughs> with a leather belt from Mexico, which said Mexico and had dove imprints on it. They used to leave them on me. But I promise you, I deserved every one of them. <laughs> every one of them. Um, but you put your nose in the corner, and you'd have to sit there to your parents, and, and 10 minutes seemed like 10 hours, right? right. Oh. That is, that's your parents version of Camp J. Yeah. They're, they're, that's their way of putting you solitary by yourself where right. all you have to do is focus on your nose in the corner. Well, that's what Camp J is, but on a, obviously on a, a much higher level. Yeah. And, and so they're locked up 23 out of 24 hours a day. And most of the time, I would submit to you, they're locked up longer. They're, you know, they didn't get that hour out. Right. Uh, but if you got an hour out, then back in the day, they only gave them like one um, phone call a month. But the if you got your hour out, it was for a shower and uh, just sweep out your cell real quick. And because they weren't letting trustees in your cell, I mean these are bad motherfuckers. Yeah. And that uh, you get out. Now I remember being a boy and going to Angola on a school tour, and they took us to Camp J, and outside. The uh, front of the camp, they had the exercise yards. Now, it's not open yards. These were fenced in, wired in yards, probably dog pens, basically. Basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say like 15 yards around. And I remember going up, and there was this convict, and he was shackled now, but he only had one arm. He was shackled Whoa. with his one arm and shackled with his feet, and he's running that circle. But guess what? They called him Wing Ding, and we've got to do an episode <laughs> on Wing Ding. Wing Ding had tried to man. escape, and they shot him at the gate and blew his arm off, and they killed the other guy during the escape. We'll tell that story. Yes. One day. But Wing Ding uh, was running around in circles, and it was a bunch of impressionable kids, and he's like, Fuck you, me motherfuckers. Y'all want to come in here and stare at us like fish in a bowl, you fucking motherfuckers. I'll kill all of you. All right? What they going to do to him? Yeah. All right? He'd already He's been, already in he'd already been back there like 15 fucking years. <laughs> he ain't getting out. And and he was going to speak his mind. Yeah. You know, but but when Camp J opened, it was, you know, it was a brand new facility and, and, and top notch. But guess what? They ain't put a lot of money in Camp J. Mm -mm. And, and it would become known as the worst cell blocks in the United States of America and probably in 
in the world. And you've heard of us talk about this before, but budgets are always an issue with prisons, no matter where you are in the country. Angola is no exception to that because obviously us as free people, you know, the last thing we want to do is have to pay for prisoners, right? right. Now it's a, it's a necessary evil. Yeah. You've got to, you know, it's just like insurance. You may, yeah. Yeah. you've got to have it just because if we didn't pay for these prisons, uh, you'd have everybody roaming free and that would obviously be a problem. But Camp J, when it opened, it was brand new. Well, as budget budgetary things came through every year, uh, they would cut the budget for right. Angola. And so what do they start looking at? Well, we're, you know, we got to cut staff. We've got to cut. We don't need to fix that air conditioner that broke, although Camp J didn't yeah, even yeah, have that. Um, but whatever it may be, you know, they cut where they had to, and Camp J got cut a lot. Camp as J the got parts. cut more than anything else. Sure. Because uh, uh, nobody gave a shit nobody about get, it. Yeah, it's CCR, yeah. right? Now, it's, think about it, y'all. If you got 6,000 inmates or 5,800, how many, many of, however many it was, you've got that certain percentage. Now, it's all rapists and murderers and armed robbers and just the worst of the worst, but most of them, are doing their time, not letting their time do them. But you you have a real, real big factor on Camp J. I mean, that certain percentage of that population that's in Angola, they're in there for, for not obeying the laws, for murder and rape and everything else. But the certain percentage, when they get there, they're going to continue to act out. It's the only thing they know. And I'm going to tell you right now, a, a huge percentage of them have severe mental issues. I'm talking about like, Cray cray motherfuckers, right? <laughs> and but you know what? The state, especially back in the day, they only had one doctor come in from Baton Rouge, whatever. Uh, um, they just these guys didn't get the treatment, and, and especially the the mental stuff that they needed. So the cells are so small, y'all. It's a single man cell. It has a shitter, uh, a little bit metal iron desk, and that's. Basically about it, and I, th- I think it's like five steps down, five, five yeah. steps back, and the and you probably could reach your arms out and touch both walls. Yeah, and, it, and it's and a closet. You can't, you can't, you don't have any direct visual contact with anyone else, um, and it's just the place that you didn't want to go. Now, again, it, it is used to take these worst of the worst, the ones that act so bad inside for the most serious charges, and they they get them out of general population so they can't continue to rape, murder, or attack staff, or whatever it is that they were doing in that general population to get swung. Yeah, yeah, and explain to them what getting swung is. All right, getting swung, y'all, means that you're when you're in the general population and you're living on these dormitories or whatever, uh, whatever your job may be, if you do a rule infraction, it, you get well, that's the term we call it. Get swung, and they swung your ass to the cell block. I remember when you were talking to Kelly Jennings, and you used to say, "Did you sw- swing your clerk?" Right. And I'm like, "What? Yeah. <laughs> what is yeah. that term?" <laughs> yeah, so getting swung is something you didn't want to have happen, but it happens. It, even like Kelly's clerk and and uh, clerk, no, clerk. I didn't have a clerk, but trustees i would have and if they you know invariably they're going to try to get over on you or do whatever and you swung their ass and they lost the privileges they may go to admin seg before the hearing or whatever but if you're a real shit hill like you attacked an officer or you you know raped someone or whatever then they swung you to camp j at angola and you didn't want to go there <laughs> not yeah you didn't want to go there so just the just the fact that it's Camp J guaranteed when you step foot on Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola and you you know we you know typically it's a life sentence so you step foot word travels fast and I'm sure the you know you're walking down that walk and they're cat calling you the other prisoners and hey hey and you remember uh, what the one guy that, that on the documentary said <laughs> the white guy who's yeah. coming out here um and y'all, I'll submit to you, I mean, I'm not being racist, I submit to you that if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger and you're white in prison, you got a problem, they're still going to get you, right? Yeah. Because, um, you know, on a cell block, that I would have it. it if there was, there's 98, or there's 100 inmates, 98 of them would be African-American, and, and you got your two white boys, right? But the 
that guy said they interviewed him on that documentary and he said yeah well, i'll tell you what you don't want to do he said everybody knows you're a fish when you get there and you don't want you coming down the side for the walk fish. try to carry all your shit and they're like oh let me help you carry your stuff he said don't do that because then then you then they come to your bunk at nine o'clock at night and take your ass yeah right. yeah remember i helped yeah, you remember i helped you carry that pillow yeah. bent over boy and that's it yeah. that's that's life that's real life there and yeah. uh so Kiana Callaway, who appeared on P2P podcast, which is which is uh, penitentiaries to penthouses, and yeah, uh, they're, they're friends of our show. And he went on there and was discussing his firsthand look at Camp J. But before we play you that clip, I want to read you something that he wrote. It was a blog online, and it, and it says, I was just 17 years old when I was sent to solitary confinement in Camp J, one of the most severe lockdown units at one of America's most brutal prisons, the Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola. I languished in solitary for 16 months. Back then, I didn't know that Louisiana was solitary confinement capital of the world. All I knew was that I had been convicted of a crime I didn't commit, and I had to maintain my humanity in one of the most dehumanizing places on earth. It's called 23 and 1 because you spend 23 hours alone in your cell and one hour to take a shower and make a phone call if you're allowed. There's no education programs. You're stuck in your cell with just the voices in your own head and the cries of men who have already gone mad. Most of the other people in my unit were suffering from mental illness. I remember how they would ram their heads into bars, play with their own defecation, or throw urine or feces. in gas. Yeah, getting gas. The hardest part of living in solitary is trying not to lose hope. Remember that word, hope. We yeah. say it all the time. Each morning that I woke up in solitary, I would quote the same serenity prayer. Remember my father reciting when I was young, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. The consequences are devastating. It's been 22 years since my time in solitary and eight years since my release from prison, but I still have flashbacks and nightmares. Even when I'm with someone else, I can find myself secluded in my own mind. I call it being psychologically incarcerated. I'm learning to identify and deal with it, but I am still not normal. That's what Camp J was doing to people. So before we go any further, I want y'all to listen to this clip. This was directly taken from the P2P podcast show. You're going to hear a story that absolutely blew my mind that Kiana told on that podcast. So it's right here. I, I spent I spent 18 months in one of the most dehuman, dehumanizing places that ever could have been created for a human being, and that was Camp J. Okay. In Angola, Nin Louisiana. Angola, Angola, Louisiana, the farm, right? Yes. yes. So, cooler one right, cell 11. They got they got cell 10. Cell 11 was the last cell. They had a guy named Money that slept on side of me for 10 months. Every morning he woke up singing, it's been a long, a long time coming. Money, money, money name was Alpha Baker. Okay. Money was in, when I went to Camp J, Money had all been in Camp J for like 14 years at this time. Wow. He got caught in up the cell block? In, in that same cell. Wow. In that same cell. That's wow. why I fight for solitary confinement today. Yeah. I was in Camp J, right? Uh, the man would come down, shift change, six and six. We know shift change. Six o'clock man come down. Who won't use the phone? Friday. What's on Friday? Chicken. Chicken. Exactly. Who won't use the phone? Everybody hands coming out the bar. Right. Okay, let me get them plates. How many people not getting the chicken plate? Hmm. <laughs> I didn't talk. Listen, I didn't talk to my mom. This is the I mean, guard? This is a guard. He's trying to eat. He getting chicken so he could swing it on the other side of the tent. You have to make they a got Joe's. decision. Uh, they got Joe's around the corner. Yeah. So, you know, it's a whole situation yeah. here. I have You only get one phone call every 30 days in Camp J at this time. Right. They was coming through the walls. Breaking center blocks. Up. Coming through the walls, busting through the walls. Yes. Who are? They're they, late. <laughs> huh. Yeah. How do you make? They bust through they could bust through the walls. But they come get you? Yes. Oh wow. Yes. If they want you, they bust, they coming through the walls. I'm they, talking about this yeah. so many times that they had to replaster the center blocks. So they just going to get malls and coming through? Coming through malls? No. You, How they get through? You, talking about you can use yeah, you can use you can, you can use you can oh, use clippers. Oh, you talking about sitting on side. You talking about you, the guy on next side so, of you. So 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 in 1998 they took the 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 the, the block, you know, in the, the working, yeah. you know in the cell block they have the flap 
right. doors where you put yeah. your, your stuff in there. Yep. You take that up out of there and you can go through the wall. Yes. No shit. Yeah, you can go through the wall. So yeah. dudes was getting jugged up? Going through the wall. <laughs> getting raped? Listen at me, going getting through the raped. wall. Going That's through the wall, man. Man, listen, man, yeah. that is a world inside of a world, man. Yes. So that was uh, crazy to say the least, Woody. Busting through cell yeah. cinder block yeah. to get in the other. By the time Keanu was there, they um, certainly Camp J was, was I mean, known for not being maintained, right? Uh, uh, they would do patches here and there and stuff like that, but the walls were rotting, the cinder block and everything else. And the if you're down 23 and 1, which I'm telling you is – there's a lot more than that, I can assure you. And you're, you're crazy or you're just a bad guy and you want to rape somebody or kill somebody, you just bust a fucking hole in the wall. Just bust a hole. <laughs> bust a hole in the wall. I'm coming to get you. Yeah, and they would rape. They would uh, go in the next cell and, and rape people. Some of these guys have been in that same cell for years, and you're, you're supposed to, you know, the rules say, uh, no more than like three months or something yeah, like that. Well, they had, they've come up for the review in three months, but if they can't get out, they're not trying to rush them out. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're gonna Depends on what you did. They're going to go. They're actually, the, the correction officers are trying to protect the other convicts and correction officers from these people from whatever they did uh, uh, to get back in Camp J. At Progressive, we know there's nothing like the feeling of riding a motorcycle with your crew on the open road. That symphony of engines roaring in perfect harmony. It's a feeling that would be impossible to recreate on the radio. Until now. Hit it, Jerry. Oh, my word. Really, really terrible. Is that a glockenspiel, Jerry? Quote with Progressive and see if you could save with America's number one motorcycle insurer. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Uh, no, no, Jerry. It's over. Now, Camp J, y'all, the mental illness factor is a real deal. I'm talking about severe mental illness. And the you think about this, uh, I, I believe the stat is something like you can go insane after like five days in solitary confinement. They've proven that. Not everybody does. Sometimes it takes longer and what have you. But the if you go back there and you go insane, you ain't worried about the fucking rule. You're going to be right. back there forever like this guy that was in the cell block in the cell next to him been back there 14 years and woke up singing every morning, right? Every morning. But they also, right before Camp J closed, they were averaging one suicide a day. You're talking about 365 people a year killing themselves because they can't live in Camp J. Yeah, that's that's absolutely insane. Now, one question you may have is, what is it like from a correctional officer perspective? Because if it's bad Shit. for the, yeah. if it's bad for the convicts, yeah, I mean, are the correctional officers is it just another day at work? You better believe it ain't. Let me tell you this: the um, I ran the largest rec room when I first started out at, at uh, Dixon Correctional Institute, and Burl Kane was my warden in the. I had a convict. Um, it, it, I told him, gave him direct verbal order, which is a real deal to you know catch his dorm because uh, uh, he was standing in the back of the thing. And he was like, "Fuck you!" And he walked out into the yard, knowing that I couldn't go. And so I, I told the captain about it, and he said, the "Next time that happens, you do it, use whatever force you got to to bring the situation under control." Well, it was a Sunday night. It, convict was standing on the back wall and I cleared the rec room and he wouldn't fucking leave the wall. And I told him, I said, catch your dorm. He said, fuck you, white boy. That's what he said. Fuck you, white boy. <laughs> and I said, okay. So I, I hit my pager and I jumped on him right as he's starting to enter the dorm. And we went fisticuffs. And the one of the only fireable offenses um, for civil service is not helping another correctional officer when they're in a fight. Well, my captain said he hit the door of the rec room and didn't see me, all the people with radios are coming, right? Then he knew Sugar turned to shit. It was a bad show. He came down there and he was like, pulled me off. I'm, I'm in this big fight in front of hundreds of inmates. Oh. And uh, the correction officer on the desk like, fuck that, I ain't getting involved. Uh, mm. um, but back, to, why am I telling you this? Because Burl came and they sent me home that night. I thought I was getting fired. And Burl came brought me in his office the next day and he said, son, I'm going to send you somewhere where you can fight Every night, um, which was the, <laughs> the, the work in cell block, which was the worst one at DCI in the two admin secretaries. But 
the the what the rule was if you don't want to work back there anymore you say i can't handle it because it's bad shit and, and these guys it's like a mini camp, Jay, but not nearly as bad. Sure. Yeah, um, but if I mean, you're fighting every night and you get gas, uh, you know. Oh my but God. Gas, y'all being that you walk down the tier and they have screens, uh, not not sell bars, but they have screens that they'll save up their shit and their piss and throw it on you, right? And then they know you, they're going to catch that ass whipping and have, they, you, but they even. If they act bad in that cell there, you got to extract them and take them out and put them on that man's seg until they hear them. Well, they're going to fight. They flood their cell, stop a toilet flooded. Uh, then they'll cover themselves with, with shit and piss. So you, you got to put your hands on them, stuff uh. like that. Now, Camp J, holy shit. If these people are killing themselves, and I, yeah, I work many suicides and on, on the cell blocks, but none of them are easy. And Camp J, they're hanging themselves or however they're doing, slitting the wrist once a day. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's it. It. So the correctional officers, fuck, you got to be a special breed to work back there. Yeah, you really did. And just to give you all paint a little picture of, of the size of Camp Jam, things like that, it was four tiers. Right. Okay. So tiers being long rows of sales, y'all. And they were 13 cells on each side of right. these four tiers. Uh, and you know, at its peak camp, J had as many as 400 prisoners. Now you may do the math and say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. If you have a sing- one person in a cell, well, there was a time they were stacking two right, in there. Right. Uh, and it's because they had so many people acting up, acting out at Angola and they had to send them somewhere and camp J was right. the answer. And so, Hey, guess what? You just got a roommate in your right. five foot wide cell. And, and, and you know, you pray your roommate is, isn't mad right yeah not mad um like angry mad but like crazy mad and i mean you know bad shit but y'all camp j the names of the cell blocks were like alligator barracuda gar and shark whereas uh like camp d is falcon and what bird names yeah they had units the main walk the main prison compound the, the dormitories are named after trees so but Camp J was the worst of the worst, and you had told me this earlier, and I believe this wholeheartedly. Uh, at, okay, I guarantee you the call in, and it's civil service, right? So you got so many days to call in sick and all that. The call in on Camp J, they're like, fuck, I ain't going in today. Well, guess what? Somebody else had to cover that shift, and they have correctional officers. They say, hey, you got to go to Camp J. They're like, fuck that, I quit. So, y'all, I'm going to tell you about, you know, the, the, Correctional officers, yeah, some of them just would rather quit than go work at Camp J. But I'm going to read you from a, a, an article, um, so just bear with me. It's called Chall- Challenges at Camp J. Camp J became infamous among officers and offenders alike, a spot where conditions were harsh and where severe mental health issues became commonplace. In a letter, Angola Warden Daryl Benoit Wrote to LeBlanc, y'all, that, that would be Secretary LeBlanc, who's over the Department of Corrections, in July of 2017, advocating for its closure. But Noah explained that within one year, 85 correctional officers assigned to Camp J had resigned, retired, or were terminated. The challenges staff encounter at Camp J are more complex than other areas of the institution, for Noah wrote in the letter, attained by the advocate in a public records request numerous times upon an officer's knowledge that they will be assigned to camp J or loaned to camp J for work detail. They will leave work sick, walk off the job or report to human resources to resign completed in 1976. Camp J has four cell blocks, each with eight tiers made up of 13 single man cells. It was used to discipline offenders following grave infractions of prison rules such as fighting with a weapon or for behavioral issues. Officials have said with it, with the opportunity for offenders to earn the way out after meeting certain conditions. Vinoy wrote that the locks for the cells in Camp J had recently begun malfunctioning, sometimes opening on their own, and offenders had figured out ways to jam the cell doors, often with toothpaste caps or buttons circumventing security checks by making unlocked cells appear closed. 
Weapons use had been on the rise along with security breaches, Vinoy wrote, but 44 weapons found at Camp J in the first seven months of July 2017. Well, Secretary of the Department of Corrections LeBlanc said he felt especially glad they closed the facility. Knowing of its compromised security after hearing about the inmate fight that killed seven in a South Carolina prison. I think we made the right decision. It was a public safety issue, a staff safety issue, and an offender safety issue, LeBlanc said. Advocates say Camp J rates of suicides and attempts have become a major issue in the desolate cells. Two suicides occurred on the same day in April of 2016 at Camp J. LeBlanc acknowledged there had been some suicides at Camp J, but said they were unfortunately happened everywhere in the prison complex and were not the driving force of Camp J's closure. Uh, I may have got my shit wrong, but I heard from somewhere, probably somebody that worked there, that they were averaging one a day at some point. Oh, I'm sure they were. And, and, and it, 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 that shit never gets advertised, ever. Unless it's that dude in Baton Rouge I did a story on that killed people at random the first day at Angola. He hung himself. Yeah, and one of the key things that you, that was said in that article just now was forty four weapons. Uh, yeah, me and Woody say this all, in, in a couple months. months, but they, they're in their cells. Yeah, and it's not like they're out in the yard and hanging, doing, and going, and going to work in the kitchen. Shit, they got they got forty four weapons in a couple months. And Woody and I say it all the time that prisoners are very they have a lot of ingenuity, absolutely, and all they have. 24 hours a day is to think about how the heck can we get weapons? How can we do this? And they get them in there. Uh, You know, you go out to a yard anywhere in Angola and you're going to find shanks buried in the ground. That's where they put them. In in cells, anywhere else. I mean, it could be anything from a melted uh, state issued toothbrush. And, you know, I mean, it doesn't take a lot to make a weapon, y'all. But at Camp J, at its peak, house more than 400 prison prisoners being disciplined in solitary cells for more than 23 hours a day yeah so imagine imagine that you get out and you know that's if you got out uh oh, i submit to you that kiana said that a lot of times they wouldn't let you out yeah they you just, never get out. oh we forgot yeah, we forgot yeah, to right you need to see the sunshine. Right. You need your vitamin D. Mm-hmm. And we're not saying, every, you know, some of those people that well-deserved sure, uh, being in solitary, maybe they killed somebody in there or whatever, but um, but very harsh, harsh environment. Now, interesting little sidebar fact for you. So Harry Connick Jr., who is a – man, and you go you to New Orleans and you don't know who Harry Connick Jr. Well, is. Well, his, his daddy was a district attorney right. forever. And, and he's an amazing actor and singer. And singer, right. And uh, Harry Connick Jr. was studying for a movie, and I, I guess he was going to be a prisoner or something in that movie. So he contacted Angola, and he said, look, I want to stay like three nights in Camp J, and I want to really get into this role and know what it's like to be in solitary confinement. And Angola was like, okay. So they yeah. let him go, and he goes into Camp J. Y'all, he didn't make it one night. Not one Harry night. Harry Connick Jr. said, let me the hell out of here. I think right, I got it. Right. I got it. <laughs> I got a taste of what, what that's about. Yeah, I mean, not one night in, Ang- in Angola's Camp J, so that tells you about it. It's looked at Angola's – Camp J was looked at as a punishment camp, as we explained earlier. It's it is where you go when you break law in prison and serious laws, yeah. serious laws, and you're not permitted to have even the basic of things. You don't get toiletries. They give you uh, uh, toilet paper while you're in there, but you can't go buy any at a at right. the. You're not getting any canteen or yeah like at the canteen you. You don't have any of those privileges, and canteen is a privilege. That's right. The food, the food. Let's talk about the food for a second. So you got a loaf when you went into Camp J. Y'all might be saying, what the hell is a loaf? A loaf is basically where they make everything for the general population that night, okay? And they might have peas, and they might have a little bit of sloppy joe, and they might have all, you know, they got a a five-course meal. A loaf is at the end of the night when they take all of that and they dump it in the same trough, and they mix it up like you would your dog, right? okay? They mix it all up, 
and then they make a loaf, almost like a meatloaf out yeah. of it, and they, they just give it to you. Give it to you. The deal is, Ugh. the rules are, you have to feed them. They, and they they have dietitians that work in the prison, y'all. They, each convict has to have a correct amount of caloric intake and in a balanced meal or whatever. But I submit to you, I don't want my shit blended up. Now, let's say it was mashed potatoes, um, hamburger steak carrots and a piece of cornbread and a piece of pineapple turnover pie and just mix it all up and they serve it to you in one life. Yep. And uh, in addition to that, another living condition, harsh living condition there was they had no AC or heat or anything like that. Screens on the windows. I mean, here in South Louisiana, it is a hundred degrees in the sunshine, right? In a, in a cell, uh, with no ventilation, you're talking about it being probably 130 in there during the day. Stunk. Stunk to high heaven. And they would actually, look, this was common. You'd strip naked and you would lay on the concrete because that was the coolest part of the cell. Right. And that's how you would sleep. Right. I mean, imagine that, right? But here's a problem. For many, many, many years, they didn't even have uh, insect screens on the windows. Now, you are surrounded on the Mississippi River by three sides and swamp in all these big open agriculture fields. The mosquitoes, I mean, I know how they are in South Louisiana anyway, but they, the mosquitoes in Angola are like saber tooth oh, yeah. rock breakers. They're eating that sugar cane. They, they, they're like rattling the window. Terminator through, mosquitoes. Right? And they come in, and look, you can't stop them. I mean, uh, to me, that would make my ass go crazy. Uh, another inmate has told a story that, okay, so they had a drain yeah. that was at the end of the tier. And you would wash out the cells as people would, uh, would I guess, get put back into general population. And or uh, when when they gas officers and stuff. I mean, yeah, they you still had to be, down. you got to get the shit and the piss out. Oh, you know? uh, so gross. And they try to, to I, I know when I used to run cell blocks and they got that hour out. They would clean their own cell. Most of it, unless, you know, mental illness, a lot of them just didn't give a shit, but most of them don't want to be in any more stank than they have to be. Right. So they would, as they would uh, have these issues, they would spray down the cells, and there was a drain at the end of the tier. So the rats, y'all, the rats, and I'm not talking mice, I'm talking rats. I'm talking squirrels. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> rats. The old rats. Yeah. yeah. So they would come through the drain so from underneath so obviously these drains have been eaten away underneath the ground by these rats and they fit through the whole of those drains and they actually come up from the freaking ground come out of the drain and this was pretty much every night and the prisoners would have to throw things at them right. to keep them from coming in the cell. They'd sit right. there and stare at the prisoners, not uh, not unlike uh, the Red Hat cell block. Right, exactly. And they'd be like, food and cotton. I see you right. have some clothes on right. maybe I'm, at that moment. I'm about to get me some. Right? Yeah, because yeah. they hungry too. Rat got to yeah. eat too. And, yeah, and you can, ate all the loaf. I can imagine the ones that fell asleep and did get eaten on the uh, – but you know, it just just a horrible situation. Yeah, and, so and staring at them. as the years went on, and we're gonna again, we're gonna tell y'all many many stories. We should probably have our own Camp J episodes or uh, companion episodes, but we're gonna tell you many many stories about it. But it's just the it went down. You know, opened in the early seventies, and it just went to shit. Good. They didn't care. They're pretty much lost souls. Uh, Locked back there, and I, I would think most of them didn't get out. So they they even had Woody, uh, a death row inmate at one point that was uh, placed in uh, uh, Camp J, and his name was Abdullah Hakim El Mamut. Okay, and yeah. he sued the president. Let me tell you why. <laughs> Let me tell you why he sued him. He sued the president and said, "I want to be moved back to death row." Because Cam J was so bad, he's like, screw that. I'm on death row. I need to be in death row. Right. Give me my death row. I mean, it tells it's you like, how bad this was, y'all. Yeah, just, uh, You're uh, suing to get to death row? Right. Whew. Yeah. Well, a lot of them, you know, escaped by killing themselves and in just the most unimaginable 
uh, conditions in, you know, no air. Well, most of them don't have air conditioners, but not even fans. Locked up 23 and 23 and one, no canteen, no privileges, no church, no education yeah. schools, no, but all those things we talked about, like in the bloody angle alive, you got to give prisoners hope. And then ones that grab a hold of the hope, like the programs and, and stuff like that, it helps to control them uh, from acting out. But they're like, ah, I don't really don't want to lose these privileges. Right. They don't have any fucking privileges. Camp J no privileges. And, uh, the, you know, there's story after story of just these these horrid things that went on. I, I've heard a story that there was a uh, stairwell, and that stairwell did not have cameras like the rest of the of Camp J had. And and prisoners, you know, whether it was deserved or not, I don't know, but prisoners would be moved to this stairwell and just get the shit beat out of them, yeah. you know, by somebody. Yeah, and can't be seen. Yeah, where it can't be seen. So, um, so it was a really bad place, and it's important to remember how uh, CCR in general, whether it was the Red Hat or whether it was Camp J, close, why those close got cell, started. Close cell Angola. restriction, y'all. Yeah, close cell restriction. Those got started because of an escape back in 1933 that we told oh, you boy. about. That was in response to that because before that, Angola was just open camps, right? Uh, they actually have one little, you know, picture of jail cell at a city hall. They have one little jail cell in each camp, and that jail cell was where the guy that basically was bad yeah. went. But after that, after that escape, they're like, we need to build a whole freaking facility. They built the Red Hat, of course, the Red Hat, notorious. And right. got closed and made way for Camp J. But you know, the you got to remember again that. The Department of Corrections job is not to punish inmates for their crimes on the outside. Their their job is to house the inmates while they serve in their term and to protect them from other inmates or protect you, John Q. Public, from, from these convicts escaping. Camp J., uh, I think they probably started with good intentions, but it ended up being a hell whole nightmare. Now, they actually had um, uh, y'all, f- you know, Camp J was four buildings. So one was actually an open dormitory. And that open dormitory was not for the prisoners of Camp J. That was for the trustees. Tru- they had trustees just for Camp J. Right. And they would be the ones a lot of times that were cleaning feces oh, yeah, and yeah. spraying the. Fuck, I wasn't doing it. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't want to be a trustee for Camp J. Good yeah. Lord. Yeah, uh, I guess it's better than being in the field swinging a hoe. But let me talk about this, Jim, uh, uh, real quick. And I think you have a clip on it. I, as a matter of fact, I know you do. Okay. I, I wanted to talk about even how other inmates think of Camp J. Okay. Now, you could say this interview was coerced, whatever, <laughs> but it is by two of Angola's most famous inmates, William Rideau, who was the editor of the Angola Light, and another, and William is a, is a black male, and Billy Sinclair, who you heard us talk about in the Brent Miller episodes. And at that time, Billy Sinclair was on death row when, that, when Brent Miller was brutally murdered, and he talked about hearing the inmates being tortured and all that stuff during the Brent Miller investigation. But years later, when this angle, not, it's not that many years later, when they there became public scrutiny in like PBS and different news channels want to look into this, all this outcry, these horrible stories they're hearing about Camp J. Now this for CNN, Fox news and social media and all that. So, you know, what they put out for is pretty much what they put out. So they have uh, Rideau and Sinclair in freshly pressed blue LSP shirts and, you know, William Sinclair's, I don't know, William, uh, uh, Billy Sinclair's hair is combed neatly. And the, uh, the, both of them are very articulate, uh, speak, speak very well, but they do this interview and 
play it for you now, and then we'll talk about it. Members of the Louisiana Coalition on Jail say they have statements from former Camp J inmates attesting to the brutality within the facility. However, two inmates we questioned, Wilbert Rideau and Billy Sinclair, who are award-winning editors of the prison news magazine, have a different perspective on the nature of the violence at Camp J. Look, prison is a very physical and criminal world. I mean, and I'm not just talking about Angola, San Quentin, Attica, anywhere. That is prison. And uh, a lot of, uh, you're going to find very, uh, 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 you're going to find violence, you're going to find force, you're going to find criminality in it. And I mean, that is the way of the world. That's the way it is. The reign of, the reign of terror is it, it definitely an over-exaggeration. It's a play yeah, on I'd words, it's a capture. Yeah media attention will have you. The reign of terror would be the situation that you would have if you did not have Camp J. Camp J is necessary to prevent having a reign of terror. But the way I look at Camp J is like this. Uh, you've got all these prisoners who go into prison. When you walk through that gate, you've got a choice. You can end up living in population like everybody else. We live in population. You've got thousands of people live together. On the other hand, you can end up in a cell. Now, you've got thousands of people who've never seen Camp J. They've never been in it. Uh, those who are in it, they had a choice. Apparently, they made the wrong choice. I'm sure they're a victim of circumstances every now and then, you know, because you have that in any system. No system is 100% correct. What Camp J does in places like Camp J is it permits to, to the penal administrators to remove that segment of prison population which won't wholesale narcotic distribution, which won't wholesale protection rackets, which won't wholesale homosexual slavery. Uh, you can take, when you have a place like Camp J, and you can isolate that segment of the prison population from the rest of the whole population who want to go about, just like anyone else in a free community, who want to go about doing their time as peacefully and law-abiding as they can. Uh, primary focus now is being dealt with Camp J and the alleged brutality that's being inflicted on the DMH at Camp J. Uh, we sort of be we sort we sort of seem to be confusing our priorities. The guys who got to Camp J and those people who are there, no one is focused upon why they're there. What about that 18 year old kid that was raped, that was brutalized, and that was maimed both psychologically and physically? by the guy in Camp J. What happened to him? You know, he's sort of lost in the, in the shuffle. And if the guy at Camp J, because he throws a, a bowl of urine on a free man, gets wrapped upside the head for doing it, you know, that becomes brutality. But what about the homosexual rape that he inflicted upon some 18-year-old kid and, 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 and the damage that was done to him? I mean, you know, so it's, it's sort of like that gets lost in a shuffle. Uh, we don't place, uh, uh, we, we seem to be confusing our priorities, you know. I'm not saying that you, because somebody rapes an individual, you probably take them with them with ball bats. Well, who's confused? Do you think the, the, these groups, the groups are. that are filing suits? Uh, uh, Vodica's group has not ever alleged or, or made any kind of uh, a statement or charges about the, the, the brutality that prisoners affect among themselves. And even now, when you have uh, the, 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 the jail rapes or when you have the gang rapes or when you have the narcotic traffic, the whole bit, the reform groups are not interested in that. They're not interested in what prisoners are doing to themselves and ways of stopping that. The only thing that penal administrators can do is to try to stop it and that they have to stop it physically because their job is to maintain control. You know, now, when they go too far in maintaining this control, then the reform groups want to jump up and say that they're, they're imposing a reign of terror. Sin so you just heard it from two guys who, mm, were they were they swayed uh, maybe by the powers that be to, to do this? Maybe. But the deal is, the truth of the matter is, that I guarantee you they slept a little bit easier at night knowing that these ones are uh, – back in Camp J for the gang rape of the 18-year-old and and all that. They, um, even the, the 
the convicts that were doing their time, not letting their time do them, they didn't want these fuckers around. They were right. a security risk also to them. Right. And and made hard time harder on them. It, That's right. You say it all the time. People do their time and let the, they let the time do them. Right. And and there's a difference between uh, convicts and, and inmates. And inmates. Yeah. And it, that being y'all and inmates, your fresh fish, the young guys that come in always getting in fights and, and dealing with drugs and do, doing the different things. Um, convicts. I mean, you know, you're, you're going to die in Angola. The, the hope one day that you can get a better trustee position and more privileges and stuff like that. Those are convicts. They don't want people to break the rules. They don't want to draw attention and have any of their, their small privileges taken away. No, they don't. And I think it's important to – you've heard what do you use some terms on here like working cell block. So I wanted to define – some of the uh, different terms that you may have heard and you're like, what's that? So extended lockdown, for example, y'all, that's a single person cell. Just Camp J Camp would be J. considered uh, extended lockdown. A working cell block is basically where the inmates in co- or the convicts leave every day. They go out into the fields and they work. Yeah, and, and usually they, they have two to sell there, but they still have to commit such a violent crime or such an outrageous crime. Same crimes that you would, you would uh, do to get sent to Camp J, but the work and cell blocks, the, um, they would do that 90 court, 90 day without a write up, but they would send them out into the fields every day. Not for long y'all. Cause by the time you fed them up for breakfast and uh, they came and marched them out in the field, it was lunchtime. And then, you know, they brought them back and then it, but they, they got out to work and for them, that's a good deal. Camp J you ain't, you ain't, uh, you yeah. didn't have a job. So it was segregated, but it was it was a working cell block. And then you had other maximum security, and that's segregated uh, for more administrative purposes. Yeah, well, if you just get in a, in a fist fight with Joe Blow and you get arrested, or even while you're waiting for your, your – these court dates I'm talking about, y'all are inside the prison. When you're waiting for your court date, you go – if you get swung – you go to admin seg first, administrative segregation. You're handcuffed. You're put in a cell until you have your trial outcome. When you have a trial outcome, they'll say, mm, send them to Camp J or send them to a work and cell block. Now, if you go to work and cell block and you fuck up again, you rape somebody you, or you gas a guard or whatever, you go into Camp J. That's right. And then you also have protective custody. And that would be, for example, we'll use Denny Perkins. Okay. Yeah. That's a. Uh, yeah. That's segregated housing for offenders determined to need special protection. Whether you're a chomo like Denny. You're, or, uh, yeah, you're a church leader uh, that molested yeah, kids. Or you're a cop that came in or went mm-hmm. uh, to prison or whatever. And then you have death row. And, of course, that's the highest security single person cells. So you get a death row. There's not – definitely you're not going to have two inmates in the same cell on death row. Yeah. That is the highest, sec- most secure part of – of prison, that's where your um, all your folks he, sentenced he to death are going. For capital punishment, but even the guy I can't remember his long ass name that you said, but even he got sent to Camp J from death row. I guess he was doing whatever gas and guards or, or COs or whatever. He was like, "Fuck that! Send me back to death row." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah so, he didn't, he didn't like Camp J too much. And then the last one is treatment segregation, and that's where he basically you're under a medical for some medical reason yeah, you're could, segregated. Yeah. So maybe it could be suicide watch or anything. Yeah. Like that. If in 2018. Camp J ceased to exist. And primarily the, you know, the letter that Woody read you a little earlier by the warden Van A, that started that process. Uh, Definitely the state looked at that. This is coming from the warden of the prison. And they said, wow, maybe we have a problem. And then you've got people like Kiana who come, you know, tell stories of inmates busting through walls like the Kool-Aid man. And uh, and raping other people, and that's real shit, y'all. He ain't making that up. Right. They were busting through the walls. Right. Every night you go to sleep, you have to worry about somebody breaking through the wall. Yeah. So obviously the or place, the rats, or, or the rats. Whatever. So from a just from a physical standpoint of the cell block itself, they had a problem. The second issue was it was 
completely over overhoused. Uh, it was three times the population that it should have had in there. And that was because a lot of people were acting up and they didn't know what to do with them. So eventually they ran out of beds and they were just, hey, if you if you shanked a guy, we don't have nowhere to put you. You're going to have to stay here right. in G-pop. Good and luck. that caused a problem. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. So uh, from a physical standpoint, it, it definitely, if not a closure, it needed to be remodeled to say the least. But even on top of that, uh, the conditions from a hum- humane, humane standpoint, standpoint yeah. were a problem. I mean, you know, the, I'm like, mm, if you ask me, fuck you. But uh, I don't think anybody should have had to live like that. That's right. So uh, it did close in 2018. And you may wonder, well, what do you do? Where, where do you send these people? Well, they didn't do away with segregation uh, in prison, obviously. You have to have an answer to those acting out. And so they went to more of a CCR type thing where it's just closed yeah. cell restricted, but you still have access to things like basic toiletries right. and right. uh, newspapers and right. stuff like that. Before that, if you were in Camp J, you had no communication whatsoever. And they also ensure nowadays that you do get that hour a day. Uh, right. You, right. you know, hey, and you're not exercising it at the park, y'all. I mean, yeah. it's a it's a little a dog cage. little dog cage, but I mean, it's something. Right, yeah. Keep you from going absolutely insane. Um, Well, I mean, I suspect some convicts are more susceptible to being going insane regardless. But either way, that's our (laughs) first. Some are already insane. That's our first story on Camp J. The ones in the future, we're going to bring, we're going to bring out some murder stories, some uh, uh, attempted escape stories, uh, anything you can imagine. And we'll bring them from the people who were there. So, but this, we want to introduce y'all to Camp J. You heard us talk about it a lot, and it is what it is, right? Yeah. It's basically hell on earth, or what what it was. That's so. right. And we just did a live this weekend. Two uh, lives. Two lives, a weekend of lives, and, uh, and just want to thank everybody who came out. We told the story uh, of the, you know, just horrific uh uh, prison murder of Captain uh, David Knapps and the hostage taking of Sergeant Radia Walker and Lieutenant Cheney, yep. and um, and it was fire. I very think. very important story. Uh, and we had we had fans come in from Dallas, from Tennessee, from Houston, or whatever, just to see us, and we were blessed to have them. I, th- I think we did the story justice and um it was a great success so thank you again southeastern um and crystal hardison oh she's awesome and and so one thing we are going to do is we were videoing uh that particular live and we are going to put it on for some patron members if you're a uh if you're a tie down tier or above, right. you you will get access to the actual video. So if you couldn't make it, we're gonna we're gonna upload it as soon as we get it. It may be a week or two before we get it, but as soon as we get it, we're gonna upload it to Patreon. If you're tie down team or above and you couldn't make the live, that's okay. You still get a chance to watch it. If you're right. not a patron member, uh you can join and and yeah. take part in that. Yeah, and we want to thank our Patreon members. You rock and uh help make the show go and we're doing three <laughs> tell me about now. it yeah. and, uh, so we appreciate and love each and every one of y'all thank you so much continue to like and share and leave us a review if you're so inclined and just can't thank you enough and look one more thing uh, speaking of lives there's crew bash coming up on the real life real cry- crime side of things that's right that's february 3rd and 4th Third is a VIP event. You can go to eventbrite.com, get your tickets. Also, uh, Saturday night, if you it's split up, y'all. If you just want to go Friday night, you, there's a price for that. If you want to go Friday and Saturday night, that's the VIP package. If you just want to go Saturday night, that's that's another ticket for that. Um, but go get them because they're not going to be there forever. And it's, we're only a couple weeks away. And... Uh, LOPA, Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency, which Jim Chapman and local leaders of podcasts are one of the many donors that have donated to our raffle. We have $50,000 in prizes, something like that. 
Crazy. It's fifteen dollars for Love. one ticket, ten dollars for um, I mean, hundred dollars for a book of ten. Get it? We're trying to raise money like we do every year for Lopa, and so appreciate if y'all go check that out anywhere on social media, et cetera. Yes, beautiful organization. All right? Yeah, great people. Lo- hey, be a hero, Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency. Uh, be an organ donor. I'm Jim Chapman. I'm Woody Overton. Your host of Bloody Angola. A podcast 142 years in the making. The complete story of America's bloodiest prison. Peace. Bloody Angola is an Envision podcast production in partnership with Workhouse Connect. Music produced and composed by Alfie DeRuin in Studio 433 with vocals by Thomas Kane. Created and hosted by Jim Chapman and Woody Overton. I walk a straight line, shackled and chained. Oh, goose and girdy is calling my name. There is no mercy in this penitentiary. Just ask the Hill Stream Gang.